Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Misha Canyon. I'm a pastor of Friendship United Methodist Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm also an alumnus of United Theological Seminary, and I am so happy to have received the invitation to bring a brief word of encouragement to you all. So thank you, Tesha, and all the other worship leaders who have uh, extended this opportunity to me. I still have fond memories of my time at United when teachers and ministers would encourage us during our seminary education. And so to have received the honor to, to do so for the current students and faculty, um, it really fills my heart with great joy and I'm humbled uh, by it. And I pray that in the same way God used uh, sisters and brothers to encourage me, uh, that this word could serve as a source of encouragement to you as well. So what I'm going to be talking about today is something that God has been dealing with me on recently. Uh, and it's really the, the subject of utter dependence upon God. And, you know, lately I've been really learning uh, how much of a gift it is to view oneself as being utterly helpless because it places you in a, in a position to then receive help from God exclusively. Um, and that's what I've been learning recently. The passage God has been using to teach me is John 15, 5, where Jesus said, Without me, you can do nothing. And thanks be to God, uh, this scripture has been coming to life for me in so many different ways. And as I'm sure the, this must happen to you, but the more I meditate on it, the more I find it popping up, illustrations of it popping up all over the Old and New Testament. So today I'd like to look briefly at one such passage that shows us how to do the work we've been called to do with a proper and biblical perspective of ourselves and of our God, and it comes out of Genesis chapter 24. Now, this is the story of when Abraham commissioned one of his servants to go and find a wife for his son, Isaac. So the servant ends up going and he does find a wife, a lady we all know named Rebecca. Now, admittedly, that's a very incomplete summary, but I'm going to have to ask you to reread the chapter if you need to familiarize yourself with, with what's happening there, especially if, as I'm preaching, what I'm saying sounds foreign to you. So this passage begins near the end of Abraham's life. And indeed, many scholars believe that uh, this actually includes the last words from Abraham before he died. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But what I do know is that this servant that Abraham commissioned, a nameless person, has a lot to teach us about doing ministry with a proper perspective of ourselves and of our God. So allow me to just highlight a few things that we can learn from the life of this nameless servant of Abraham. So number one, he's secure in his identity as a servant of Abraham. In the entire passage, we never learn the name of the servant. And I think this is actually pretty significant because the Bible often goes out of its way to mention people who play little to no part in the actual story. For example, and maybe this is a bit of trivia for you Old Testament students, but who was the man that sold Abraham the plot of land that Abraham used to bury Sarah. Do you know? Well, if you're thinking about Ephron the Hittite, then you're absolutely correct. So we know Ephron's name, who played a little role in the story, but we don't know the name of Abraham's servant. Again, I think this is really significant because he actually does have a bunch of speaking parts in this chapter. And at any moment, uh, especially when he introduced himself to Rebecca and her family, he could have recorded his name, and then it could have been recorded for posterity. Indeed, in the 34th verse, he has the perfect opportunity to tell us about himself. But instead of introducing himself with his name, this is how he introduces himself. He says, I am Abraham's servant. Now, what does this teach us? Well, one of the things it reveals is a desire to be known only in relation to his master and a refusal to make himself known or make a name for himself. You know, I think one of the ongoing temptations in ministry is the temptation to be known, to be somebody. It's just a recycling of the old temptation the devil tried to use on our Lord when he was in the wilderness, when he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and said to him, all these I will give you if you bow down and worship me. That desire to have a name, to be recognized, it seems innocent at first, but whenever we want to be known by anything other than being a child of God, it's going to inevitably lead us into a snare. As Christian, one of the characters in John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, stated, The man that takes up religion to gain the things of this world will throw away religion to gain the things of this world. This is true whether we're talking about money, power, respect, or even reputation. 
the desire to be known as anything other than what we're known of in relation to God will eventually lead us into a snare. But if we endeavor to be known only in relationship to God, we'll discover that there's no reputation on earth, no accomplishment we can achieve that even comes close to that of the lowliest servant in the house of the Lord. Also, this provides us with an opportunity to draw our attention to the name of the Lord rather than making our own names known. We can be content with being known by him and spend our time making his name known and his name great amongst others. This is why the man introduced himself by saying, I am Abraham's servant. And let it be enough for us to say, I am a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Here's point number two. He understood the importance of his work. Now, each of us have been called to do the work of ministry, called by God to do that work. Whether it's preaching, teaching, singing, counseling, or whatever, all Christians have been called by God to some kind of Christian work. And we must understand that the work is important, not because we're up front or because the community values our contribution or anything else, but it's important simply because it's important to God. In the same way each small stone is important to the house an architect is building, your work, no matter how great or small it appears to you or to others, is of immense value to God. And knowing this should lead us to work diligently, creatively, and with wisdom. And we see this in Abraham's servant. He understood the covenant relationship between Abraham and God. He understood that for Abraham, finding a wife for Isaac uh, from his kinsmen was very important, and it would enable Abraham to continue walking faithfully before God and entering into the promise. Therefore, he works, and he works hard. Earlier this year, I read a great book by a Benedictine monk named uh, Dom Jean-Baptiste Chartard called The Soul of the Apostolate. And in this book, he says that in our role as Christian workers, our joy is nourished when we contribute to cause the object of our love to be served and honored. He goes on to describe the Christian worker as a venator animarum, a hunter of souls. Now, I got to be honest, I immediately wanted to adopt venator animarum as a title instead of reverend because it sounds so much better. But that seems to go against the thrust of the message, doesn't it? But the reason he described the Christian worker as a hunter of souls is because he says the Christian worker has the joy of contributing to the salvation of beings that would have been damned. And thus he has the joy of consoling God by giving his souls from whom he would have been separated for eternity. And I think he's right. That's why your work is important to God, because it contributes to the salvation of souls that are precious in God's sight. In other words, it's a continuation of the work of God that we see happening in Jesus Christ, the work of spreading God's salvation through all the world to everyone you encounter. That's why I love uh, the Apostle Paul's little line from Romans eleven thirteen, where he says, I magnify my office or I magnify my ministry. And as you grow in an understanding of why your work is important to God, you too can magnify your ministry. Then also like Abraham's servant, you can work hard to please your master. Number three, Abraham's servant trusts God, not his work. And this is very important. While you're working hard to please your master, as Abraham's servant does, resist the temptation to trust your hard work. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the greatest temptations in Christian service is to begin thinking that your success came because you put in the work. People will tell you about how wonderful your sermons are and how, how much your singing touches their soul. In other words, because your work for the Lord has been successful, people will misattribute the success to you and they'll thank you and rightly so. But what ends up happening is with all those compliments, we'll end up trying to duplicate the results by doing what we did before. And we'll begin trusting our work rather than trusting the God who, who led us to the success. And if your trust is in your own ability, this is where ministry will become wooden and formulaic because you'll, be, you'll begin doing what you did last time to get the same results as last time. And time spent in prayer will become less and less important against the weight of studying and meeting people and doing the work of the Lord, you know. But we must remember that it's not our effort or energy that brought the results. 
It wasn't our brilliance or creativity that sparked the interest in the person listening. No, it was the presence of God. As the Holy Spirit breathed fire into you and through your work, which was natural, it then became supernatural. You know, I think a perfect example of this is what happens during communion. The bread and wine are just bread and wine, but then we pray, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And it's then that what is natural becomes supernatural because it's infused with the real presence of Christ. And this can be true of all of our labor. Therefore, like Abraham's servant, remembering that it is God's portion that brings us success, we must pray just as we do during communion and ask for God's guidance and power to be at work in the job he's called us to do. Number four, we have to praise God. This is the last thing that we learned from Abraham's servant, the importance of giving God the credit, the credit or praising the Lord. After God answers his prayer and Rebekah, Isaac's future wife, is revealed to everyone, it says in verse 26, the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. Man, it's, it's so easy to forget that part, isn't it? It's so easy to get caught up in the, in the excitement that falls successful ministry that we often forget to praise God. But see, this goes hand in hand with understanding our identity, knowing our own helplessness, and knowing God's all-sufficient power and grace. Because the person that's aware of who they are will realize immediately that God has done something that deserves praise and that deserves credit. Think, for example, of when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. What's the very next chapter about? It's a song of praise, isn't it? To who? To Moses? Were they thanking Moses for the way he held his staff up in the air? No, Moses was just a vessel. The next chapter is a song of praise to God. I will sing to the Lord, they shouted together, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. You see, they recognize their own helplessness and God's might. Therefore, when the success came, they didn't start drawing attention to the tiny part that they played, but they praised God for once again coming through in the clutch. That's what Abraham's servant does here. As soon as Rebekah does the very thing he prayed and asked God for, he drops down to his knees and begins giving God the praise and glory. Listen, this is the one right here. For too long, many Christians have withheld the credit from God. Did one person tell you that your sermon opened their eyes to the truth of the gospel? Then praise the Lord. Was someone moved through the music that you played? Then give God the glory. Did your professor compliment you on your paper? Then ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due his name. We should learn to say with the psalmist, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And this will come as we understand who we are and who and what God is. Well, look, I was only supposed to preach for between 10 and 12 minutes, but hey, man, you ask a preacher to preach, a preacher is going to preach. Let me go ahead and wrap this sermon up, though. Here are the four qualities, again, that we learned from this nameless servant of Abraham. Number one, he didn't try to make a name for himself, but was content to be known only in relation to his master. Number two, he understood that his work was important to his master. Therefore, he worked hard and saw the job through to the end. Number three, although he worked diligently, he didn't trust his work. Rather, he sought guidance from and trusted God to bring about the success of his work. And number four, he praised God for the success he experienced. Well, sisters and brothers, like Abraham's servant, you have been commissioned by God for, for work that is of the utmost importance to God. Therefore, go into your work with a commitment to work diligently as unto the Lord, trusting not in yourself, but in the God who called you. Turn to God for guidance and trust that since God commissioned you, he will also make provision for you. Then when God causes you to experience success and bear fruit, ascribe to the Lord the glory that he is due. Thank you again for your time and your attention and the opportunity to preach to you. And may the Lord bless you as you continue training for the work of ministry.
Amen.